let's get to the word. We are still in Hebrews, the book that I've been preaching through, but it's a milestone. We're starting a new chapter. We're on chapter three this morning. So uh, turn to chapter three if you've got a Bible with you or press whatever buttons on your phone you need to to get to Hebrews chapter three. And we will start at verse one and just read half a dozen verses, six verses there from Hebrews. Oh God, we thank you for your word. It speaks to us even today. It will carry on speaking to us because you have poured your life into your word. So we ask for you to bring us words of encouragement, hope and sustenance this morning. Speak through me. Speak to all of us, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus the apostle and high priest whom we confess. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honour than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honour than the house itself. For every house that is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. In Hebrews chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 2, I kept bringing out these lessons. Jesus is better than, he's better than the angels, he's better than, you name it, he's better than it. And we're going to get onto that in chapter 3 here. Jesus is better than Moses, but that's not my message this morning. We're going to keep that one until next time I preach, which is, you know, sometime next month. But we're just going to focus for today on that first verse. So I think the next slide might just be that verse on its own. That's the one I want us to get really deep inside us. Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. And we're really not going to move away from that through everything that I say this morning. We are encouraged, in fact, we are commanded to fix our thoughts on Jesus. Now, some of the different Bible translations, the King James says, consider Jesus. And I said it's a command, and I really do need to emphasize that. We can read this as if it's sort of saying, oh, here's something to think about. And you know when you hear that phrase, it means, I don't have to think about that. (laughs) This is actually saying, no, this is something to think about. Fix your thoughts. The word I'm told in the original language is a really active, participatory word that we need to, to, to make a deliberate decision, to be absolutely committed and wholehearted about fixing our thoughts on Jesus, considering Jesus, making him the center and the very essence of our lives. So that's my encouragement. The title for the message is just Consider Jesus. Two words, Consider Jesus. Now, why do we need to do that? Well, we're commanded, but I'm going to expand a little bit and, and, and explain why it's important for us to do it. But please, please hear me. This is a message for you, and it's a message for me. You can say, I've been a Christian for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. I know all about Jesus. Well, praise God. Consider Jesus. Let's be obedient to what the Word says, and let's build ourselves up in the faith using the guidance that's written for us in God's Word. So if you are the most mature Christian in the room, consider Jesus. If you are not even a Christian, or you're a very, very young Christian, can I tell you it's exciting just to keep fixing your thoughts on Jesus and letting him become more and more part of your life. And we mustn't compartmentalise bits of our life. You know, in, in, in our worship this morning, we have lifted Jesus high. And that is so important. And then sometimes we can sort of think, okay, now the preacher started, it's on to something different. Well, actually this morning, it's, it's, it's carrying on with the same. Lifting Jesus high. So I want to be a worshipper as I preach to you this morning by just lifting Jesus high and, 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 and encouraging you and reminding me, let us consider Jesus. Let us fix our thoughts on him because that way we are going to be stronger. We are going to be more stable in our faith. And oh, there's so much benefit that comes from it. So please listen in. It is for you this morning. I might not have any Bible verses to read that you say, cool, I've never read that one before. That doesn't matter. Take what we know and let it go deeper. 
and let it change us. So but before we get on to that, let's just have a look at a couple of things in here to, to pick out. No, go back, go back, 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 back. There we are. You share in the heavenly calling. I think in my last message, I said we are destined for glory because that is contained within Hebrews chapter 2. And that idea follows on here. You and I share in a heavenly calling. You know, tomorrow morning when something goes wrong, you remind yourself, I'm called to heaven. You might have to deal with, I don't know, the dog's been sick in the corner or the kids are screaming or whatever. You've got a heavenly calling. It doesn't matter what life throws at us to destroy and destabilise us. You are called to higher things and we will get there. That is our destiny, that is our promise, that is absolutely sure. That's why we should be singing songs like, you're coming back again and I with you shall reign and get excited about it because we're going to spend far more time up there than we've spent down here. <laughs> and up there, there won't be any dogs being sick and there won't be any children playing up. We will be living our heavenly calling, but today we're just looking forward to it. So keep reminding yourself of that. Keep your eyes looking upwards rather than being dragged down by the, the dross and the hassles of everyday life. And there's something else just to pull out in that verse before I get into the heart of the matter. It calls Jesus our apostle and our high priest. And I don't want to preach my next sermon this morning, but we're starting to get into a little bit of the book of Hebrews where the writer is unpacking for us what it means to say that Jesus is our priest. Now in the Old Testament, before Jesus, that's the first two thirds of the Bible, there were lots of priests. God said, you need priests. People who will serve in the temple, they will lead, they will offer sacrifices, and that's part of the way people related to God. And now you can move on, Steve, to that quote. Now, I normally, I like you, those of you that hear me preach quite a lot, I like to put in some quotes from books and from famous preachers and whatnot, and I normally put a photograph up, otherwise the slides are just words. I, I didn't know what William Barclay looked like, <laughs> and I've got books by him, a commentator that died 20, 30 years ago, something like that, so I really had to dig out that particular um, image of him, but um, a, a good Bible commentator, and he says this, this is just a whet your appetite for the next sermon. The priest is the person who builds a bridge between man and God. To do that, he must know both man and God. He must be able to speak to God for men and to speak to men for God. Jesus is the perfect high priest because he's perfectly man and perfectly God. He can represent man to God and God to man. He is the one person through whom man comes to God and God comes to man. I'm going to stop there, otherwise I've got a lot that we could say about that. But this will go on now for, for several chapters to come in Hebrews. Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is our apostle. So we need to fix our eyes on him. We need to concentrate on him. We need to consider him. Um, okay, so go on to the next slide, please, Steve. Um, and on again, that's just... Right, so I've got two questions this morning. First one... Why is it important to fix our thoughts on Jesus? Mr. Word out, I've had a hassly morning with the computer. So uh, why is it important to fix our thoughts on Jesus? And then the second one is, how are we going to fix our thoughts on Jesus? We'll spend far more time on number one than on the others. So let's start answering that question. Why is it important to fix our thoughts on Jesus? Go on to the next one, please, Steve. This is basic, but Jesus is the foundation of our Christian faith. Without him, nothing. It's all about him. And, you know, there are churches that know that, but that can get out of the habit of proclaiming it. Because church life, just like any aspect of our life, we can crowd out the important things by other stuff. And we need Jesus. He is the foundation. He is the very heart of of everything that I stand for and that this, chance, this church stands for as me as a Christian and this church as a Christian church. He is the foundation. Now I came across this recently, um, should have a picture on the next slide. Okay, so this is Spurgeon. You've probably heard lots of people mention the name Spurgeon during a sermon. He was known as the people's preacher. This is back in the Victorian days and he 
was a great, great preacher. Many people quote him but don't know much about him. I've got books and books and books by Spurgeon. I've got one, I've got one book I've got two copies of, so first one to ask me can have it. <laughs> a, a whole book of, well, of his sermons from one year that I mis- mistakenly bought a couple of years ago. But um, Spurgeon, a fantastic preacher. And in 1861, he'd been pastoring this church in London, young man, and they built a brand new church building, Metropolitan Tabernacle, a huge church because thousands of people were coming to listen to Spurgeon and on the very first morning that Spurgeon preached in that new church he declared this I propose that the subject of the ministry of this house this church as long as this platform shall stand and as long as this house shall be frequented by worshippers shall be the person of Jesus Christ and he lived that Spurgeon did that Now, he founded a Bible college, he founded children's homes, he's a famous man, he wrote books, etc., etc., but at heart, he was a preacher who lifted Jesus high and built everything he stood for on Jesus Christ. That's the foundation. The same book that I saw this quote in, also quoted from Spurgeon's last sermon, which is about 30 years later, and he's still lifting Jesus high in his sermons. That is our foundation. That is what we need as a church and you need as a Christian. There can be a lot of busyness, there can be a lot of responsibility, but at heart, let's keep Jesus right at the center where he belongs. Okay, let's move on to the next one. We're answering the question, why is it important to fix our thoughts on Jesus? Now I've put this in quotes because this is like a little slogan here. The gateway is the pathway. Now, I've heard, heard preachers talking about this, mostly not from our sort of tradition, actually, but I think they make a really good point. And they either word it this way, the gateway is the pathway, or sometimes they put it even shorter, the way on is the way in. What do I mean by that? I mean that when we become a Christian, or when we're explaining the gospel to someone who isn't a Christian, we talk about Jesus. We talk about his ministry. We say, you know, he he lived and he taught and he he was the son of God and and, and, and he gathered people around him and he did miracles and then he died on a cross and he did that so that we could be forgiven from our sins and and you could be forgiven too and you could be a new creation and, and, and you could become a Christian all through Jesus and then somebody becomes a Christian and then we're off on another tangent. And sometimes churches have to come up with all sorts of discipleship programs because these new Christians don't actually grasp that the way they start through Jesus is the way they carry on through Jesus. He is not just the door through which we enter, he is the very path that we walk on. What did he say in John's Gospel? I am the way, the truth and the life. He didn't say I am the gateway. I am the start of the way. I am the doorkeeper that's opened the door so that you can start. He said, I am the way all the way. You with me on that? If somebody stopped me in town and said, you know, how can I get to Yeovil? I'm in my car. How do I get to Yeovil? I'd sort of get them to the top of town. And I'd say, right, go down the hill. That's the grove. And then keep going straight. Don't turn off. You'll get to a roundabout with a huge big lamppost in the middle. Just don't go off towards Poundbury, that's a mistake. No, carry on and go all the way towards Yeovil. You know, that's the start of the way, but it's also the way. You just keep driving then, and you're in Yeovil. You have not got to turn off. And Jesus is not just the start of the way, he is the way. So tell the new Christians about Jesus, but tell the mature Christians about Jesus. He is the pathway, not just the gateway. Now, one of the things that Karen and I do as a hobby, actually Kezia at the back as well, is we go geocaching, which is when you're out in the countryside or out in a town looking for things that are hidden, using your phone as a map, following some clues, and, 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 and you find what you want, you log it, oh, that's another one. You know, great fun, we love it. It gets us out of doors, it gets us in the fresh air. But sometimes, and it's, this has happened more than once, we're following the path, and I've got the map, and there's a clear footpath and you walk and you get to a stile. And on the stile, there's a little, little plaque, a little, um, what do you call it, a little marker, 
with a might be a nice blue arrow. So, oh, that's the way I'm going, you know, and off you go. Yeah, I'm following the path. This is all going lovely. And, and then you get to a gate and, okay, I can see the path, but this field in front of me is just full of crops. Where's the path? I, I'm sure there's a path here, but where is it? Now, I am useless at crops. So I'll say to Karen, what's growing here? Is it carrots or potatoes or asparagus? I don't know, it could be anything. And I just can't tell. She'll tell me, and we've got to make a decision. Do we just walk because this says there's a path? Okay, I'm going through. The farmers just sow these seeds everywhere. There's a path, or are we a bit more polite and we sort of walk around the edge? And eventually you meet up with a path at the other end. But you know, that's a pain in the neck to us because we know where the path should be, but we can't find it. Got the gateway, but I haven't got the path. Well, I praise God in Jesus, there are no secret paths. There's a very publicly known path. It's Jesus. Start with him and keep following him. Get to the end, you're heaven called. Okay? It's that, that straightforward. A couple of weeks ago, I listened to a comedy on the radio. I think Rob would have heard it as well from Mark Steele. Mark Steele is a comedian who, it, it, it's normally called Mark Steele's in town. And he goes to a town and basically does a half hour show where he just takes the mickey out of that town for, for 30 minutes solid. You know, what's funny about their shopping centre or their, uh, um, their accent or something like that. And I love him. I think he's, he's really, really funny. And he did one about East Grinstead. Now, I love his comedy when he's taking the mickey out of a town when I know the town because you can really identify. I think he did one for Weymouth a good number of years ago. Weymouth, no, I won't go there. But East Grinstead, when Karen and I were teenagers, we used to go to youth camp just outside East Grinstead, down in Sussex. And it's a weird place. It really is a weird place. The, there's a, the biggest Mormon tabernacle in Britain is in East Grinstead. Oh, that's, that's strange, why is it there? But that's not the only thing. The head of Scientology is there. Now, if you don't know what Scientology is, that's a cult. Weird beliefs, all about aliens and strange. And it's, it's what some of the Hollywood stars are really into. So what, what we've got Tom Cruise and um, Elizabeth Moss and... John Travolta. John Travolta, thank you very much. <laughs> and the thing about the Scientologists is it's all about secrets. And if you sign up to join them, fine, they'll welcome you in. And then, oh, if you come on a course, if you pay for a course and come to East Grinstead, you can get, get level one course and you'll move up another notch in following this alien person who, whatever. And if you do that, oh, guess what? There's another one. Come and pay a bit more. And they reckon that to get to the top level, you have to pay £250,000. 10,000 here, 10,000 there, 10,000 there, because you're trying to find the way uncovered in secrets, step by step, at a cost. It's nonsense. And I praise God that we serve a saviour who said, I am the way. No secrets. There's more ways stuff to learn. There's always things to grow into, but there's no secrets. Nobody's going to say, we've just found the answer to la di da di da whatever it is. Can we have £10,000 and you can know it? In fact, if someone does say that, show them the door. Show them the door. Don't entertain that sort of nonsense because Jesus is the way. Okay, let's move on to a third reason. Why is it important to fix our thoughts on Jesus? And it's because we do need to continually remind ourselves that he is Christ, that he is Lord, that he is Messiah. Because the pressures of life will just push him sideways. And you can end up, and we probably all know them, Christians who one day were really going out for God. They were, you know, all guns blazing. And now they're just plodding along the Christian pathway. They might go to church, they might not. Do they pick their Bible up? Oh, I don't know. Do they pray? Well, sometimes. And somehow what they believe and what was so living for them has become cornered. It's become stifled. And we need to remind ourselves of that. That's why we gather to encourage and build each other up. Otherwise, we, we are in danger of drifting away from it. 
The stuff that we know, the stuff that is foundational, the stuff that we started our Christian walk with, we've got to be careful, every one of us, me included, we've got to be careful that we do not drift away from it. And we keep Jesus as Christ and as Lord. Have I got the Matthew 16 scripture next, Steve? Yeah, yeah, okay. So Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples. And, um, okay, it says here where it was. He was in the region of Caesarea Philippi. And he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. What about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not overcome it. This was an important day in Peter's life because it it was that day that he realised, he understood, he grasped, possibly for the first time, that Jesus, the man he was following, that he was spending all of his time with him, hearing his teachers, doing the great, seeing the great works that were being done, and it suddenly dawned on Peter, this is the Christ. This is the Son of God. Now the word Christ is a Greek word, it's the same as the Hebrew word for Messiah. So Christ, Messiah, same thing, just two different languages. And it means the chosen one, the anointed one. So everything in the older parts of the Bible that was promising God's going to send his special chosen one, that is Jesus. And Peter realised on this day, I'm in the presence of Messiah. I'm in the presence of the Lord God himself in, 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 in my mate Jesus. It was profound for Peter. And it needs to be profound for you and for me. Now, if I asked you... Who is Jesus? Every one of us in the room can say what Peter said. He's the son of the living God. He's the Messiah. But we can say it because we just repeat the answer. We've heard someone else say it, so we just repeat it. So in a sense, we're right, but it's not, it's not come from the heart. It's not full of God-given revelation. And what Peter had there, and Jesus recognised it, he said, blessed are you, Peter, because no one's taught you this. You've got this directly from God himself. And that, I would say, is really part and parcel of someone becoming a Christian. We all have a slightly different journey and a slightly different story of of the moment we became a Christian, the day we became a Christian. But it's when we realise everything we've been hearing from Christians, from churches, it suddenly makes sense and we go, wow, I've got it. Now I've got to start following. Now I've got to start living. Now I've got to start obeying. Because it comes from the deep down heart. He is the Christ. Not, he's the Christ because Alan told me. Or or he's the Christ because David just keeps on about him every Sunday morning. No, he's the Christ because I understand it deep down. I believe it. It's been revealed to me. And some of you will have heard what I'm about to say. You'll have heard it many times, so forgive, but it's worth repeating. When Jesus said, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, Jesus was playing around with words. Because this was not in English. Jesus didn't speak English when he was uh, walking around on the planet. So when he said, you are Peter, he said, you are Petros. That was Peter's name in Greek. You are Petros. And on this rock... Petra, I will build my church. Your name is Petros, and on the Petra, I will build my church. So in one sense, Jesus was saying, Peter, you are going to be a key player in the building of the church. And Peter was. But Jesus was saying something else. He was saying, you are a rock, Peter. Your name means rock. But I'm going to build my church on the rock of what you've just said on your testimony, on your confession, that I am the Christ. I am the Son of the living God. I am the Anointed One. And that carries on. What is the church built on? The rock. The rock Christ Jesus. So praise God for Peter the man, and praise God for his input, his ministry in the early days of the church, along with others. But 
the Church of Jesus Christ for 2,000 years now has been built on that revelation that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. And we all need that. And if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian or you're not sure you're a Christian, this is the crunch point. Who do you say Jesus is? He's just a nice man. He's a good teacher. He's one of the key people in history. If that's your answer, I would put it to you, you haven't quite arrived yet. You haven't got it yet. But keep going and we'll be praying for you because we want to get you to the point where you're able to say, I might not understand everything. I've got a long way to learn and my life's got to get a lot of stuff sorted out in it. But I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he's the Messiah. I believe he died for my sins. I believe that the way to live is following his way. That's the point of becoming a Christian. That turnaround in our understanding that life is not about me, it's about following him. We would love to talk with you, we would love to pray with you. If you're still at that part of your journey, am I a Christian? How can I become a Christian? Will someone explain a bit more to me? That's where it is, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. Starting there, gateway that becomes the full pathway. Okay, let's go to the fourth little bit I've got to answer this question. Why is it important to fix our thoughts on Jesus? Did you put the two in there, Steve? Or maybe... <laughs> anyway, why is it important to fix our thoughts on Jesus? Thank you if you did. Here it is. We need to be changed. Let me share a verse that has really captured my imagination recently. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Have I got the right one? Yeah, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, that's it. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Jesus is coming back. We sang it and we're going to sing it again. Jesus is coming back, and this verse promises that when he does... I'm going to change and I'm going to be like him. Now, it answers two questions. When am I going to be changed so that I'm fully like Jesus? When he comes back and when I see him. But the second question is, why am I going to be changed? And it's there as well, because I see him. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's the key to changing me from what I am to what I'm going to be is seeing Jesus. You with me? Some of you are just waiting for that to sort of sink down from the ears and the brain and get to your heart. When we see him, we will be transformed. The work of shaping us into godliness is going to happen in an instant. Pizzazz, bingo, it's going to happen right then. We are absolutely going to be like Jesus when we see him. Well, that's going to be a great day. So do you know what I want between now and then? I want to see as much of Jesus as I can. And it might only be a glimpse here and there. It might just be a thrill when I read one page of the Bible. It might be a, a real whoa moment when I'm enjoying worship and praise in church. But every time I'm encountering Jesus afresh, I am being changed. Is that good? Is that, do you want to tell your faces that that's good? You know, that that is actually life-changing. So why is it important? Back to the title, consider Jesus, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Why does that matter? Oh, because it's a spiritual discipline and we're supposed to do it. Yeah, we're supposed to do it, we're commanded to do it, but actually it does us good. It changes us. When he is central, when he is our focus, we become more and more and more like him. You can't just make yourself more like him. That is the route to frustration, to, 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 to just being worn out and burnt out. We become like him by seeing him more clearly. Oh, I said that verse. That verse has really, really gripped me. And uh, I, I hope it'll do something for you as well. Okay, all right. So that's answered the first question. Why do we need to fix our thoughts on Jesus? Why do we need to consider Jesus? So then let's look at the second question. Uh, go on, another one, please. Yeah, how are we going to fix our thoughts on Jesus? Now, I'm in a bit of a smush here as the preacher because I can't think your thoughts for you. 
I can't tell you what to think. You know, if you go up to um, Brewer Square in town, where that big horse statue is, there are signs on some of the lampposts saying, don't even think about parking here. It offends me every time I see them. Who can tell me what I can think? <laughs> no one can tell me what I can think. So all I can do is to encourage you. But as I've preached through Hebrews, a number of sermons now, chapter 1, chapter 2, and we're just starting chapter 3, you've had, you've received the fruit of my considering Jesus. My pondering, studying, praying, preparing. But this verse says all of us need to consider Jesus. So I want to encourage you to do that and I want to just try something that might help you. And I came across a book, I don't have the book, um, that was written in 1871 and that means it's so long ago you can find it on the internet for free because the author's dead and there's no copyright. <laughs> and it was written by a man called Octavius Winslow. Thank you Jess for not calling our uh, baby Octavius, that's a, <laughs> bit of a, a bit of a hard name. But Octavius Winslow was a, a popular Victorian Christian writer who wrote devotional books for people to read on their own and just, just to, to help them in their spiritual life. And he wrote one called Consider Jesus. So you can see where his ideas came from, from Hebrews, from chapter 3 and from verse 1. His book was to encourage his readers to consider Jesus. And his book had 31 daily readings with a title, a Bible verse, and then about a page of his writing. Now, I've read it, fine. I'm not too bothered about what Octavius Winslow said, quite honestly. It's fine, but it's written in Victorian English, which is not really the language that I speak. I speak a slightly brummified version of modern English. But I thought, what a brilliant idea to have a set of daily readings that just focus our thoughts on Jesus. So I've nicked his idea. And I took his verses, and I took his titles, and I thought, I'm going to change the titles, and I'm going to, there's a few verses I want to add in, and there's a few I'll take out. So he, 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 he gave his readers 31 daily readings that his readers had to buy the book for. I've given you five weeks, that's 35, that you don't have to pay anything for. Yay. Okay? And... I've got them printed out, which is why I've already told some of you I've been fighting with my computer this morning. And, yeah, so it looks like that. Now, some of you are even thinking, oh, no, not something to read. I'm not a good reader. Well, every day, you can testify for me, Alan, yeah. every day just has a, Bi a title and a Bible verse. Mm -hmm. yeah. One verse. I'll give you a clue. One of the verses has two words in it. Jesus wept. <laughs> So I'm not asking you to do a lot here, but I'm saying, if you think I had a few things to say that were quite thought-provoking this morning, that's great. If you enjoyed this morning, that's great. But the real acid test is, are you going to go away and consider Jesus? How are you going to bring that into your daily life and into your devotional life? And I would say, take one of these and just use it. I've put a little bit of space for you to write if you want to write. Simeon asked me this morning, are these going to be marked? No, they're not. I don't want to see them after I've given them to you. They are, I, I, I just want you to find your own way of engaging with this idea of, can I think about Jesus every day for a month? A little bit more than a month. I was up in the loft. You know what it's like when the family's coming to visit. Oh, we'd better tidy up. <laughs> so me and Karen were taking stuff up the loft and getting stuff down from the loft. And so I went to one of my bookshelves up there and I got hold of this volume, which I knew was there. And this is actually embarrassing, but it's dated in 1984. This is before I went to university. I was a teenager. What's highly embarrassing is I can read my own writing. I, I can't blame my teachers for my bad handwriting, because then it was good. Now it's awful. But in those days, some of us used to read Bible study notes called Every Day with Jesus. And they would come in two monthly chunks, just a little booklet. And there'd always be a passage written by Selwyn Hughes. And then in the, in the margins, it said, for further study. Anyone remember those? And there would be a couple of questions, two questions, always two, and three or four passages of the Bible to read. And I was aware, even as a teenager, that it was so easy just to read that, gloss over it, and say, I've done my bit for the day. 
So what this book is, is every day two answers that I wrote on that day to the two questions. It was my discipline, my personal, I'm going to engage with this. And the question might have been really easy, so you get a very short one, or it might have been half a page, as I'm thinking and engaging with whatever the Bible study notes were then. Now that was, that helped me. That might help you. So, you know, just write on these sheets or write somewhere else. I've, I've, I've said in the little introductory bit to it, you might want to read, because it's just one Bible verse, you might want to read it in the morning, read it at lunchtime, read it in the evening. So it's gradually just washing over you. You might want to read it in a couple of different Bible translations. You might just want to write out the verse in your own handwriting. Some of you probably don't pick up a pen these days because we're all pressing buttons. But, you know, just it's to get us actively engaged with this, I am considering Jesus. I'm not just having a quick reading and putting it to one side. So please take one. Now, I know what happens on these mornings. Some people will come straight to me and ask for one. And some people will find every excuse not to even, you know, catch my eye this morning. Just take one. Just take one and consider Jesus for a few weeks that, that come ahead. Now, if you are really um, engaged with this and, and, and it does you good, why not post something on our messenger board that many of us are on? That, that just really just, hey, you know, I've really, re, re, really enjoyed this this morning. It's, it's, it's a great thought. I would just say, if you're going to do that, Make it come from your heart. Don't just copy something that someone else has written on Facebook and you paste it for everyone else. I want us to consider Jesus for ourselves, not just echo what someone else has considered about Jesus. But if that helps you, please take one. I've written the verses out and they're in the New International Version. I know for some of you, you love the King James Version. So I've actually printed a slightly alternative version which has got the King James there. So ask me for one of those if you particularly want it. But, um, but please, please take one. And if it helps you, fine. I think, even if you've got your own daily Bible reading programme, just adding one verse a day isn't going to throw your whole day into havoc, is it? It's not going to take hours. You know, there's, a, there's a, an acronym on the internet. What is it? TLDR. When people send an email, oh, that's TLDR. Too long, didn't read. <laughs> I'm guilty at work. I write long emails, but usually I'm asking people to do things. They've got to do this, 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 this. That's fine. I'm their boss. That's what they better do. But long emails sometimes don't get read. This isn't TLDR. This isn't too long, didn't read. This is short, consider Jesus. With me? Yeah. I'm going to finish there. I'm going to pray, then I'm going to ask the musicians to come back up, while I'm praying actually, you can come back up, and let's sing the Thank You Jesus song, and let's really put our energy into lifting him high through this song, and may this be the start of us going away from church this morning, saying, you know what, I am going to consider Jesus, I am going to fix my thoughts on him, I am going to make him more and more the centre of my life. Okay, while the musicians gather, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is everything he claimed to be and more. Thank you that through your word, he is revealed to us through each other. We are journeying together and encouraging each other to be true Christians, Christ followers. And I pray for everyone in this room that we will just move it up a notch over the next few weeks in considering you and, and getting to know you more, pondering you, meditating, praying, worshipping, responding, whatever it might be, will you meet us, Lord, as we commit to doing this? We want to fix our thoughts on you because you are the Son of the living God. You are Messiah. You are our Saviour. You are our coming King. And we are excited about you. So help us, Lord, to live this out in our lives and for your glory. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Calvary.
died for me. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you. Thank you. 